all-inclusive vacations make life easy with endless eats, bottomless drinks, and never-ending fun. So booking an all-inclusive vacation should be easy too, right? That's where Apple Vacations comes in. Book your all-inclusive getaway with Apple Vacations and receive exclusive perks at select resorts. You'll find the best deals to Hyatt, Zalara, Riviera Maya in Mexico and enjoy a selection of exclusive nonstop vacation flights. Turn on easy mode at applevacations.com or call your local travel advisor to get started. Visit applevacations.com or call your local travel advisor to get started. Hi, it's Gabby Reese, and this podcast is powered by Laird Superfood. It was created in our kitchen by my husband, big wave surfer Laird Hamilton, and it all started with a simple idea. What began as Laird's secret for long-lasting energy on the waves is now Laird Superfood, offering a full range of delicious plant-based creamers, coffee, greens, and more. Visit LairdSuperfood.com and use the code GABBY2024 and save 20% on your first order. It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Welcome to Monday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live here on Giants.com as well as the mobile app. He's Paul Dottino. I'm Lance Meadow with you for the next 60 minutes. Multiple ways you can interact with us here on the program. You give us a ring, 201-939-4513. Hashtag Giants Chat on Twitter. You can also directly follow each of us. At Lance Meadow, one word, last name, M-E-D-O-W. He is at Giants W-F-A-N. It is presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. And as a reminder, you can find the archive of the show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcast. So we're going to continue our prospect preview. We'll have two West Coast teams coming up, USC and UCLA. That'll mm-hmm. be a little bit later on in the program. But we figured we'd start off, Paul, the owners' meetings are going on right now as we speak, and all the coaches and executives are in one spot, and this is the time of the year where they vote with the competition committee to determine whether or not they want to make any rule changes. The kickoff has been a big topic of discussion. That has yet to be approved, but we do have three changes that have been approved so far in terms of the rules. So let's run you through them, and then we'll react. The Lions had made a recommendation to protect the club's ability to challenge a third ruling following one successful challenge. That has been approved. Usually there was a max of two. Now you can get to three as a result of the Lions. Then the competition committee also is going to approve allowing for an enforcement of a major foul by the offense prior to a change of possession in a situation where there are fouls by both teams. And then the third one, which to me is of biggest note, Paul, is the fact that they are eliminating the hip drop tackle because it has been deemed too dangerous. There have been several players that have been injured. So this is now something, again, on defenders' minds that they need to go through Mm -hmm. in the process Mm -hmm. of making a tackle. And I would say of all the ones that have been adopted, the last one is set to have the biggest impact of all on the game upcoming season. Players, especially, uh, you know, the guys who have made these kinds of tackles are going to have to relearn how to do it. I mean, it's just that simple. Look, here's my stance on this, Lance, and I told you this before the program. I'm all for safety. How can you not be? I love the game. I bleed the game. I breathe the game. But there's no question that anything that can be done to make the game safer is good. Now, at what point do you actually impact the integrity of the game because you're trying to make it safer? Is there such a thing as making it so safe that you're actually taking a chunk of the game away with your ruling? That's where we're kind of at here. My only thought, and the reason that I'm going to say I'm in favor of this, is because the hip tackle has really been targeted as an ultra-dangerous play, which has caused some very serious injuries, and the players are, are very much aware of it. It doesn't do the game of the NFL any good when you have serious, serious injuries occur to any player at all. That, 
over the long term, that's just not good. So I'm inclined to agree with it, again, primarily because it is a legitimate safety concern. I'm with you in that, excuse me, it's going to force defensive players to think a little more, to try to make sure they tackle legally under the new rule. It's, it is going to have an impact in the game. I can't deny that. But if it legitimately saves some really serious heinous injuries, then I'd have to say I'd be in favor of it. Mark Andrews comes to mind, the Ravens yeah. tight end, Dallas Cowboys running back Tony Pollard, who mm-hmm. obviously is now on Tennessee. Those were two players in particular no doubt. in recent history that were injured with the hip drop and, tackle. And it's not good for the NFL when guys like that are knocked out for a season. Sure. It's just not. Well, I mean, there's no doubting that. I'm like you. I'm all for safety. But in fairness, there's been plenty of other notable players that have been hurt from something that's completely unrelated. And that's to true, too, tackle, right, because Paul? the game is dangerous. Yeah, I mean, it's there football. Are, it's physical contact. There are things that can knock a player out, and there are many, 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 many more on the list than this particular tackle. I understand. And that's why I'm against it, because I think it gets to the point where you're picking and choosing what you want to govern, Paul, as opposed to yeah. prioritizing safety. So that's where I have an issue, and I think the worst possible element in play now is, which is what you were hitting on earlier that I've been campaigning heavily is, I think the worst thing that could happen is you make these defensive players overthink too much. In the process of the game, the goal of any defensive player is to make the tackle bring the player down. I don't think the majority of NFL players who play on the defensive side of the ball are saying, how do I bring a guy down and hurt him? Okay, I am not a believer in that. People want to spin that. They want to say that there's some dirty players. Well, Paul, there's dirty players in every sport. Okay. Yeah. But I don't think the hockey majority, too. Correct. One hundred percent. The enforcers. Yeah. But I don't think the majority of NFL defensive players, in their mind, in the act of tackling, are saying, "What can I do to leave a mark on this guy and get him to be assisted off the field?" I agree. So what you're now going to put them in the position of doing is. Where can I target the body of an offensive player? And the fundamentals to me get discarded, Paul, as a result. So what you're going to have happen is, and listen, there's some guys that mentally are on another level. But you're going to have guys that are thinking so much that they take themselves out of a position or a bad angle, right, Paul, to make a tackle. Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen? Going to have mishaps. Going to have mental mistakes. Going to have more explosive plays on offense. And I don't envy the coaches now on the defensive side of the ball, Paul. Mm -hmm. What you have to go through now in the film room to teach these guys, really, the better term is reprogramming them. Yes. I mean, and that's hard. Because think about it, Paul. You have a seasoned veteran. He's been in the NFL for eight years. He knows how to approach the game on defense one way. Now in year nine, you're telling him, no, can't do that anymore. It's very hard to get a player to tweak their mindset. I would only counter this. We did it with the quarterbacks. When they started taking away certain types of hits on the quarterback, landing with your full body sure. weight, not getting them down by the knee, they started taking that stuff away. And the defensive players immediately cried, well, come on, we're supposed to try to get after the quarterback. And now you are really limiting and squashing the types of things that we can do once we get there. And oh, by the way, we've got momentum going toward the quarterback. When we hit him, we hit him. And it's not always easy to try to change and morph your body into a way that's not going to cause a penalty. I get that. I absolutely get that. And the outcry when they started to protect the quarterback with more of these rules was very loud. It has somewhat dissipated over the years. But I think this is a similar situation where initially there'll be some people extremely upset with this rule, saying, well, what are we supposed to do? But then over the course of a couple of years, it'll start to kind of fizzle a little bit, and people will get used to it, and uh, that'll just become part of the norm. And your point about the quarterback is fair. I just think that that only impacts maybe a certain segment of the defense, whereas this, when you're talking about open field tackling and wrapping a guy up, Paul, by the hip, I would say that takes a toll on everybody. Well, sure. Defensive linemen, linebackers, secondary players. So that's why I'm a little bit more concerned. Now, I heard Rich McKay, who is the Falcons executive. Mm -hmm. He was formerly with the Bucs. He's the head of the competition committee. He gave a presentation to the media. And 
based on the reporters that were there, Paul, what they're trying to outlaw is, and I need more of a visualization to understand this, is when the defender leaves his feet and wraps up the guy and uses his body weight to get that down on top of the offensive players. It seems that's the element in play. But you know what's going to happen is they'll review a play and now frame by frame I know, tells a different story. I know. So I'm looking at it more from a big picture. We do have standpoint. that trouble with the quarterback now. No doubt about where it. Where they talk about employing your full body weight to crash the guy to the ground. Yeah. And, and, oh, flag. And how do you judge that in real time? In slow motion, it's tough enough. In real time? In many instances, it's it's really not doable, and you're just forced to go with whatever the call is, and half the people are going to be unhappy about it. And that's why, as a result, and this is what you were alluding to earlier, I think in the early stages of this, so right away this season, players are going to be penalized because, you know, the officials, mm-hmm. it's a point of emphasis, Paul, right? Yes. So the officials, they're going to throw the flag, and there are rules, and I've brought this up time and time again where there have been some controversial calls in Giants games where it's written into the rule book for the officials. When in doubt, throw the flag. Mm -hmm. And that's specifically pertaining to the quarterback rule with the body weight, meaning from an optic standpoint, if it looks bad, throw the flag. Now, to your point, replay may tell a different story. But But, but it's not replayable. Well, in certain instances. Hits on the quarterback cannot be replayed. So you're telling the official error on the side of caution – don't hesitate to whip out the laundry, but then, oh, by the way, if you made a mistake, we can't fix it. <laughs> well, and that's why I am very supportive and I defend officials because I think they have a thankless job. They I do. don't think enough people understand they that. They absolutely do. Because I'll be the first one to admit, not that I have experience in officiating, Paul, but if you put me out in the zebra shirt and you had me chasing these guys full speed, I'd probably miss things too mm-hmm. because there's different angles, there's crevices in the game. It's hard. I don't think there's enough talk about that. And, you know, I was even having this conversation on my serious show because we're in the midst of March Madness, right? So the officiating is put into the microscope in basketball, mm-hmm. too. You never hear, you know what? That officiating team did a really nice job. Nobody ever says that. It's like the Rarely. offensive line. Rarely. Right? The offensive line is talked about when they're not doing their job. But actually, when they do their job, nobody walks away from a game saying, That was a really good job. And the reason I'm bringing this up, not to get off topic, I don't know if you saw, but in the Oakland-NC State game, when it went to overtime, there was an inbounds pass where one of the best players for Oakland, the ball went off his fingertips into the backcourt. So the officials didn't call a backcourt violation. Okay. Because to the naked eye, you'd be like, wait a minute, the offensive player touched the ball. It wasn't deflected. Right. It went into the backcourt. But Gene Steratore, who is multifaceted and fantastic at his job, right? Uh, but People big forget, fan of Gene. He's a, a basketball official and an NFL official. Did NCAA yep. and NFL simultaneously. So yes. he later relayed this to the broadcast crew. It wasn't mentioned in the act. And I understand because in the heat of battle, you're looking at it and you're saying, well, what's going on? But Steratore relayed to the broadcasting crew, the offensive player never had full possession of the basketball. And that's why it was not a backcourt violation, Mm -hmm. meaning he never had a grasp of the ball and then lost it. If that was the case, backcourt violation. Yes. So the bottom line is the officials got the call right. Yes. They did not blow the whistle. But how many people are going to remember that and say, those officials knew the rule book, backwards and forwards? I think. So I brought that up as an example. Both in basketball and football, it's really good that the networks have gotten some of these officials who have retired. The experts. To come into the booth and say, look. I agree. You were on the field. You were on the court. Let's just take the announcers out of it. You be our rules expert. You take care of anything that seems a little bit questionable or we just, maybe we got it wrong. Maybe our announcers thought it was something, but wait a minute. You saw something on the replay, and you can explain why the rule was employed correctly. Yep. I love the fact that we now have legitimate officials on the TV broadcasts. I, I think it's outstanding. I'm completely with you. I think it adds a different facet to the conversation, and you should have individuals that are experts because I've said this time and time again. Paul, if you took out a printed version of the NFL rule book, I mean, good luck understanding and digesting every nuance of the rule. You just got to the next point that I mentioned to you before the program. They're talking about a new kickoff rule. And once again, the impetus is to improve safety. I get that. I'm all for it. I thought the XFL 
kickoff was a pretty cool thing. And, and I think, I don't know what the numbers were, but I, I would suspect that safety was a very big benefit off of the XFL kickoff formation. I don't know that. I don't have the stats, but I think it was. Now, all I know is the proposal that's in front of the committee, the NFL committee, competition committee, about kickoffs is a morph between some twists and turns and the XFL kickoff rule. It's got about nine different subdivisions to it. Like if the ball lands here and bounces here and goes through the end zone or goes out of bounds or the guy tries to call for a fair catch or if the guy fields it cleanly on a fly. With all those subdivisions, I said to Lance earlier today, how is a player who's in the field of battle at the moment supposed to think about all these nine different subdivisions on the kickoff rule while he's trying to make a play? <laughs> Never mind the officials who are going to have to legislate it, or those of us who are watching the game who would like to understand it. (laughs) To me, again, I'm all for improving safety, and if they want to change the kickoff rule, fine, because I don't want to see it eliminated. I'd like to see the kickoff stay in the game. But can we please make it simple so that everybody, the players, the coaches, the refs, and the people watching the game can easily understand it? How about that? I'm with you, and I'm all for that. The more convoluted these rules get, I think it takes away from the game. Speaking of another tweak, Tom Pelissero of NFL Network is reporting that, I'll read the exact tweet, quote, this is big. NFL Competition Committee Chairman Rich McKay told me the replay assistant will now be permitted to correct certain types of incorrect calls for roughing the passer and intentional grounding. Must be purely objective quarterback wasn't hit in the head, was out of the pocket, etc. See, I don't know if I love that. To me, that's a very open-ended, Paul, definition where you say must be purely objective. So that means the replay assistant can look at a roughing the passer play, but you know based on those replays, frame by frame, did the full body weight go on the player? How do you define that as objective? Well, If he is word for word accurately representing what the question is about the video, I'm actually for it because if it's contact to the head, you can clearly see that in 99% of the videos if there was contact to the head. The full body weight thing is different. That's not really clear. You could see, but you don't really know. What did they put their hand down first? But to it's avoid clear. The body yeah. But but a shot to the head, you can ninety nine percent of the time you could see if there was contact to the head, and you can absolutely see with all of the cameras now that they have at NFL games if that quarterback is in or out of the. No, that box. I understand. That's sure. very easy to see. Yes, I'm with you there. So if if they're willing to put that rule in to help clean up those two things, which to me aren't that hard to see on replay, I'm good with it. Yeah, I just, I get worried where it says certain types of incorrect calls. This is selection Sunday almost all over again, you know, where you're picking and choosing who you want to put under the microscope and who you don't. Yeah, but see, There's a lot of borderline calls in the NFL. The shots to the head thing, I've been after that for years to be video replayed reviewed because you say that's in the name of safety and I buy it. I buy it, but it's a significant penalty. Okay. We know that it's 15 15 yards. yards. It's a, it's a big time penalty. Big chunk. It's usually on a play where, you know, either there was a sack involved or there was an a big incompletion involved because it obviously it's from a hot pass rush. Where a guy's going to get hit in the head. And that could also mean just incidental contact. No question. Going to face two. And so usually that call is made in a big spot. So it has a dramatic impact on the game. So I've always felt like if they could get that one right, they need to do so because it's usually at a critical moment in the game. No, listen, I understand that. I just, I'm less is more. That's my philosophy. Less we put under the microscope, less replay. I think we just accept the human element. So the wording, I really want to see the actual new rule because the way that Tom Pellicero worded it on Twitter has me very concerned. Must be purely objective. I mean, that... 
purely objective. I could have 75 different people interpret that and give you a different perspective. So that's a little bit of a breakdown in terms of the rule changes that have been implemented or at least have been discussed. So we'll open up the phone lines and then top of the hour, we'll turn our attention to additional prospects as we gear up for the 2024 NFL Draft. Jay is in Phoenix joining us here on BBKL. What's happening, Jay? What do you got for us? Morning, guys. Um, Hi. Great conversation about uh, the rules, and, and mine was going to kind of go along with that as well, my comment. Um, one of the things I keep thinking about is we're watching the NFL. You talk about, you know, the, the rules kind of changing the game. Is there any thought? Is there any I – mean, maybe – hopefully the NFL rules guys are listening right now. Can we expand the rosters? I know we have larger um, practice squads. But can right. we expand the rosters to, let's say, 60 players? Every team's got 60 players. Mandatory three quarterbacks on your roster. You can have more if you want, but at least three. Because I feel like the, the, the game is getting diluted because of injuries, and it's been going on forever. Well, but, but Jay, in fairness, I mean, I don't mean to cut you off. They have the emergency quarterback rule now, so you're able to put a third quarterback on the roster. To your point, they've expanded the practice squads, and you have limitations, but you could call guys up. And on game day, we went from 46 to 48 in terms of who could be in uniform. So I would argue I think they've made some headway in that department that you're asking for. Yeah, I, but I guess my question is, is it, it, in today's rosters, why not have all 53 dressed? Why does it only have to be 48? There's a, there's a reason why for that. I, I, I remember I talked several years ago uh, about this when Jerry Reese was the Giants GM. And the reason given is this, is that every single week of the NFL season, there are teams that are going to have a handful of players who are likely unavailable because of injury. What they try to do by, by giving you the uh, six inactives and then usually the, the other quarterback is the inactive guy, what they're trying to do is level the playing field. They don't want one team on Sunday having 53 guys all dressed and the other team, which has five guys injured, have to have five less guys. This way, by taking six guys out plus the seventh quarterback as the, the designated third quarterback, they're lowering that number to the point where that dead area of inactive guys, usually at least half of them are injured, if not all of them. Sometimes, hey, we've been doing Giants games where that entire list was full of injured guys. Well, healthy scratches. You, 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 didn't, yeah. you didn't even know. You know, it's like, well, who are they going to think about scratching? It doesn't matter. they got seven guys hurt. So those are the seven guys who are out. That's the point. They want teams to be able to go into every game with within a player or two have the same number of guys in uniform. That's the reason for the inactives every Sunday. Oh, that make, that makes good sense. I appreciate that insight. Uh, at, back to the quarterback thought, though. You know, and, and like I said, expand it to fifty-five. Expand it to whatever. It'd be nice to be able to have a third quarterback be a developmental guy. Let's say the Giants draft Joe Milton this year. It'd be nice for them to have Daniel Jones. Drew Locke and and Milton there as a third guy they don't have to expose to get into the practice squad to get picked up mm -hmm. by somebody else or even Do Tommy DeVito who I really like but you can keep that third quarterback who you can develop and not well, worry but, about exposing. but Jay you can do the that you just need to sacrifice a roster spot they can keep three quarterbacks on the roster there's nothing preventing them from Jay, having three Jay guys. I'm with you uh, on this because I think that the the quarterback pool in the NFL has been so badly diluted over the years with expansion and obviously just the the amount of capable quarterbacks I think the league should say listen if you want a third quarterback you don't have to expose him to waivers to put him on the practice squad. He can be a protected third quarterback that you put on the practice squad without having to expose him. This way, you're giving all of these franchises a better opportunity to try to grow and develop a third young quarterback within the confines of their own building. I totally agree with you. But I don't think changing the roster number is the way to do it. I think you can do it just by saying that third quarterback can be put onto your practice squad without exposing him to waivers so that he doesn't necessarily have to get bounced around to another team if they want to claim him. Yeah, because, I mean, if you're going to make a yeah. tweak to the roster, it should be due to safety, not due to give a team an opportunity to develop a younger quarterback. Right. I mean, that to me is, is a little impractical. And I appreciate the phone call, Jay. Thanks for giving us a ring. 
I'm all for if you want to have one player on the practice squad fully protected, Paul. I mean, I could certainly live with that. I would say probably most teams are going to use the quarterback position, especially if they have a younger guy. But I don't think it's not the job of the NFL to look out for teams to develop a third quarterback. You should have to do that based on your own decision well, making within the 53 man roster. I think it is for the good of the game. For the good of the game, it's important that we have as many capable quarterbacks involved in the National Football League as possible. So, for the good of the game, I think they should do that. The league should legislate that because it's better for everybody in this league if you've got third quarterbacks, young developmental guys who can stick with the coaching staff and be nurtured. I think that's good for football in general. Well, you could say other positions too would benefit from mostly, that as well. Mostly the quarterback, though. We all know how that's the most important position on the field. That's the guy who's got to digest the playbook. That's the guy who needs the most grooming. Uh, I, no, I, I, I would argue that it's for the good of the game. I mean, once again, I look at that more as a luxury. And oh, by the way, the third quarterback emergency rule, I don't believe was exercised at all this past season. Just to give you an idea. No. Yeah. So once again. Because it's, it's a penalty. You have to use one of your 53 to be able to use it. I remember talking to one of the Giants front office people about it before the season. I said, the rule is stupid. And they said, yeah, because it's worthless. Because well, if, if you don't want to expose that 53rd roster spot, or should I say use it up, well, then the new rule is pointless. It does not apply to you. And teams did not wish to use that 53rd roster spot. So the rule was was absolutely impossible to use. It was worthless. Well, also there's limitations in terms of when you could bring that third quarterback into the game too. Correct. So, I mean, you had to have lost the two guys that are active first. And then if they can return, you have to take the emergency guy out of the game, Paul. So there's a lot of conditions that have to be met just to get to the third well, emergency. To QB Jay's point, is my point. Why not just? I, I'll go for this too, Jay. If you want to do it, forget about having a protected, a young quarterback go to uh, the practice squad without being exposed to waivers. That was my suggestion. Your suggestion was just allow every team, if they want to, to keep a third quarterback on the roster, number fifty-four, perhaps. I'm okay with that too. Well, that once again, you're expanding. But the now roster you're expanding the roster. That. That's the problem. Yeah, now so. you're adding another active player, and that involves the money and the revenue share and everything else. And the imbalance of right. some teams have healthy guys and some teams don't. So to so be honest, gets into I think area. I think my rule is probably a little bit more practical, and it would still get something similar done in that you'll be able to groom and nurture these guys and to get them uh, more prepared for an opportunity to play. Yeah, and once again, I just still go back to as good as the emergency quarterback rule is to have, you also need to see if, if teams took advantage of it. And I know there were several injuries, but we never got to the point because by the time the following week came, teams were able to make transactions to shuffle personnel in terms of their quarterback depth chart. All right, let's try to squeeze in another call before we have a pair of interviews. Donnie is in Queens joining us here on BBKL. What's happening, Donnie? What do you got for us? Hey, guys. I'll make it quick for you because you have somebody coming on, but... Uh, just in regards to this hip drop thing, I, I have two issues with it. Uh, the first being it's just putting too much on the officials who are already having trouble yeah. refereeing the games as it is. I know. Calls that have been in the game, and this is now just another judgment call that is going to lead to more yeah. automatic first downs. I mean, how many penalties are automatic first downs uh, for the offense? There's no such thing as an automatic punt uh, for the defense. So it's just – it's creating such a wild imbalance between offense and defense yeah. and the way the game is called. And secondly, what's next? When, when <laughs> do we stop I know. The game? I know. I know. They have, even just the 17 games and the seventh playoff team has made the season feel longer. It's made the regular season games feel less important. And you know they're going to 18 eventually. Yeah. So eventually you go to eight playoff teams. It's going to happen. So what they're doing is they just gradually keep changing the game to the point where I'm now 38, and in my lifetime, the game is already becoming unrecognizable. So no offense, Paul, but I can only imagine the, the sport you grew up watching, <laughs> what you're watching now. My man, I, mean, I had goalposts on the goal line. How about that? Yeah. Goalposts on the goal line and receivers who had their hand in the ground on the line of scrimmage at the hike. How about that? Yeah, I mean – I mean, something like this to me, if you want to legislate it out of the game, 
you know, maybe create a system where if a player does it, they get, you know, one warning. The second time it's a fine. The third time it's uh, a fine and suspension. But I think the statistics they put out, they said that basically this happens about once per game in the NFL. So that means every weekend when you sit down to watch the NFL, there's going to be a, a, a automatic first down given to the offense yeah. because of this play. And that's without – error from the officiating where they start calling it more right. because it looks like it or sure. it happens to yeah. I know, it's, I know. It's just utterly ridiculous. that they're, they're trying their best to kill, which should be an unkillable product. And I'll just kind of leave it at that. And But w- one quick thing, I'm going to hang up the Paul, I'm stunned you're not all for an offensive line at number uh, – number six, but we could talk about that another day. Okay. Thanks, all right, Donnie. Yeah, appreciate call, the call, call us back another time. Thank you. Well, I mean, just in terms of the point, I would agree wholeheartedly the fact that I am for less, as I mentioned earlier, and I think you're putting a lot more emphasis on not just the referees, the players, the coaches. I mean, everybody is going to be stressed out with some of these new rules, and any additional overthinking is not good. And I would also agree with the last caller's sentiments that I was never a fan of postseason expansion because I do think it waters down when you have teams that are hovering around 500 that get the last playoff spot. I don't think that's good for the product either. I think six was fine, but I'm not naive. I understand money is involved in why we add additional playoff spots. Just remember, even though George Washington passed away a long time ago, he still (laughs) rules everything that goes on in the world. I'd go a little bit higher than George Washington, Paul, okay? (laughs) I I think uh, there are other presidents that maybe belong in the conversation. (laughs) You're a little bit low in terms of your (laughs) estimate, but we'll leave it at that as we'll name the presidents and the various green as we move forward here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Now let's turn our attention to the 2024 NFL Draft, and we're going to focus on a pair of West Coast teams, USC followed by UCLA. Let's start with USC, and we bring in Eric McKinney, managing editor at WeRSC.com. Eric, you got Lance Meadow, Paul Dettino here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Greatly appreciate the time. Hope Bowl as well as everything on your end. Yeah, absolutely good. We're uh, just getting started with spring ball at USC, and obviously just had the pro day there, so plenty plenty to talk about at this point. Well, I think Paul and I were having a conversation before the show, and I said, you know, Caleb Williams is one of the prospects, but in all likelihood, he's going to be off the board by the time the Giants select number six. But let me at least throw out one question, because... He has been a bit of a polarizing figure, Eric, and you've seen him up close and personal. A lot of people are looking at this past season and they're saying, well, you know, wasn't as good as 2022. How do you analyze Caleb Williams' play and whether or not there should be more emphasis taken into consideration on what he did prior to this past season when determining his outlook as an NFL quarterback? I I would look heavily at the 2022 film what he did when he won the Heisman Trophy there was more it it felt like what happened this last year and this is this is for basically every USC offensive player it felt like there was so much pressure on every offensive player that they had to score a touchdown on every single play because they knew if they gave the ball up, they were going down seven. Because that that was, that was what <laughs> kind of the faith in that USC defense was this year. And it, it felt like they played a little tight at times and, and really trying and, and knowing, right, if we don't get 10 yards, 15 yards, if we don't hit a home run on this play, we're, we're not going to get the ball back quickly. And when we do, we're going to be down by more than this. So I, I do think that there was a lot of, how poorly the defense played that factored into some of the film this year. That being said, you can still find just a, a, any number of outstanding plays that he made. I think the USC offensive line took a significant step back in 2023. And again, I think Caleb Williams played at times knowing, hey, if I get to a five-step drop, I'm going to get hit. So I've, I've got to have my eyes down, make a move first and then try to figure something out and, and that's really playing into what you see a lot oh he didn't play on schedule there were very few times where he got into the the top of his drop back and could find anybody whether it was wide receivers not getting open remember you had jordan addison in in 2022 sure. who was mm-hmm. almost always open and so I, I think the supporting cast took a step back this year 
for USC, and there were times where the the play of Caleb Williams uh, really sort of reflected that. Being said, as far as his personality, his locker room, his whatever, the players loved him. The coaches had no problems with him. I mean, this is something where that guy is so uh, well-known and, and so visible now where if there was an issue or something in the locker room, somebody would have said something. Something would have leaked out. We, we would have heard enough about that, and everyone just kind of lines up. No, he was great. He was, he was everything we needed in terms of a, a leader and a, and a guy to be back there and, and having the ball on every snap. All right, so basically the splash plays are the things that gets everybody all excited about him and why I think he's going to be overdrafted. Look, I'll tell you right now, I would not take him first pick in this draft, but that's just me. But the Bears obviously traded Justin Fields. Everybody in the world seems to think that he's the guy they're going to take. But who knows? I mean, remember when Baker Mayfield got taken by Cleveland? And that was a turnabout within 24 hours. All of a sudden, everybody's like, oh, they took Baker. How'd that happen? So what are you getting with your antenna? Is is this going to be the Bears pick at number one? Or do you think they're going to change up and they're going to wind up going somewhere else? Or has there been so much feeling out by other teams at the USC campus that someone else is going to make a crazy trade to go up and get this guy at number one? It, it'll be interesting. I'm curious, kind of, with, with the Bryce Young deal, right? I mean, you've, you've seen how those two franchises have been positioned now with giving up so much to go up. I, I don't – certainly I would not, right? I, I think that you're giving up too much to go up to number one with, with what that would need to do. Now, if you're, if you're Washington, right, and it's the hometown thing and that pull, then maybe there's something there – it would be it would be shocking, I think, to to pretty much everyone if the Bears don't just sit there and take him uh, at one. I mean, Keenan Allen coming out to his pro day to take a look. I know that doesn't you know it doesn't guarantee anything, but certainly you can, you can read into that sure. and the field deal getting done uh, ahead of time to kind of clear the way for this. And, and I don't think I, I just don't know if the the Bears are going to get any kind of red flags with him on that Caleb Williams is right I mean he's ready for the for the spotlight he's ready to play I like that he is willing to kind of you know learn and be a student of the game and and all of that he doesn't necessarily look he's got confidence right I mean you have to if you're starting quarterback in college at a place like USC at a place at, at a few schools you've got to think hey I'm I'm really good I'm really good and he does carry himself like that, it'll rub some people the wrong way, I'm sure. But it's, I think it's the mentality that you need to have as a quarterback. There's, he's not, he's not a slam dunk. I mean, the the height, he he downplays mm-hmm. it. The height is is an issue, absolutely. The fact that he does really like to hold the ball mm-hmm. and make make big plays, that's going to be something that that he absolutely needs to work on. But when you when you talk to kind of quarterback coaches that have worked with him and just how he sort of functions in an offense when everything is there. Wide receivers are, are not necessarily wide open, but a, a little bit more advanced than, than what he's had to work with. And, and when the offensive line gives him, I mean, three seconds, three and a half seconds, for, forget six, seven seconds. If they just give him a, enough time, he can play on schedule and he can make throws. His, his arm talent uh, is, is pretty impressive, but I do agree. I, you know, there's, it's not a slam dunk. He's not a slam dunk. This is the best prospect that, that we've ever seen. I'll bet on him, though. I, I think he's going to be good, and I think he'll do the work that he needs to get there. Well, Eric, he had various weapons around him. Let's focus on the wide receiver position. I want to throw out two. You got Brendan Rice, who comes from very good genes. <laughs> Jerry Rice only happens to be his dad. And then Taj Washington, who obviously is projected to go a little bit later on in the draft. I mean, Rice has great separation. He's got great speed for a guy that has size, which you don't necessarily see. But from the two of them, what perhaps are the concerns as to why they won't go maybe as high or as low as they're being projected in your mind from what you've seen? So Rice never, Brendan Rice never dominated again. When you look at him take the field, I mean, it is like, okay, I got to watch that guy. I mean, he shows up and he is physically impressive. 
he can move pretty well. It's not one of those like uh, unheard of size to speed ratios, but he had a few games where it was like, oh my gosh, he's catching everything. His first year at USC, especially, there were there were some drops and some inconsistencies. He never became like the, the absolute number one dominant receiver. Now he caught 12 touchdown passes uh, this year, and so he was certainly productive enough. But I, I think it's I think it's that I think it's maybe some of the agility stuff, and then can you just dominate defensive backs with that size? I think maybe those are are a couple questions. When, when he had it going, it was one of those things where Caleb Williams looked at him quite a bit it wasn't a guarantee every single game that that was going to happen and then for Washington what would be Just, perhaps the concern because I mean clearly he doesn't have the biggest frame in comparison to Rice so size is a little bit more of a question mark for him as opposed to Brendan and and that's it that's it it's size and then if you're going to be right he checked in at, at just under 510 174 at USC's Pro day. If right. if you're gonna do that, right, he ran a, a four five two at the pro day. So you, you'd like if, if you're gonna be little, you'd like to be a little faster. Now that being said, Taj Washington is became in his time at USC, and he transferred in from Memphis, uh, became an just an unbelievable kind of do it all wide receiver. He blocked, they lined him up in the backfield, he'd go in motion. He did. He was one of those guys where teammates and coaches would say. You guys don't even know half of what he does for our offense and, and making it function. So he's one of those, just put him on the field and he'll make plays, and, and he is a great receiver. The draft, though, as you guys know, a lot of times it's for ceiling, right? And so I don't know if, if it's quite as high as some of the other receivers that maybe ran, you know, 4-4s four or, or things like that. That being said, I – Again, like I said about Caleb, I'll, I'll bet on Taj Washington sticking on a roster and, and becoming a real contributor. He can play on special teams, both as, as a returner and as a cover guy, uh, and then just, just did it all uh, as a wide receiver. He was a guy, I mentioned Brendan Rice, like you don't know which Brendan Rice is showing up. He was a guy this year where it was every single game you knew, okay, Taj Washington's catching a handful of passes and, and making one or two big plays in this game. And, and uh- he turned into a really consistent contributor. Eric, we only got two minutes left for your spot, so I'm going to ask you very briefly. Marshawn Lloyd, significant injury uh, history at running back, including a torn ACL. I, I think that's going to hurt his grade in the draft and, and drop him a bunch. So I'm not even going to ask you much about him. I'm more interested in, in Kalen Bullock, uh, the safety, whose measurables – are really, really attractive to NFL teams, but his play didn't necessarily live up to those measurables. Your thoughts? He was one of those guys. I think he got knocked a little bit with the Alex Grinch scheme, and, and you, you might hear about that from every USC defender coming, coming out of this draft, where there was so much confusion on kind of what they were asked to do and what was going on, and, and every play it felt like guys were looking at each other like, who had that guy, what's going on? And, and that was something we covered all year long. He is, he, his range from sideline to sideline is unbelievable. The question is going to be physically, what can he do? Can, can he become a good tackler? Can he match up uh, with tight ends and, and with bigger receivers? Those are going to be the questions. When you watch him do ball drills, when you watch him work out, it's like, okay, that, that's a guy that I want super fluid, can go up and get a good hand, everything you want in terms of a, a rangy kind of deep coverage safety. Can he stand up physically to what the NFL is going to ask him to do? That That's the question for him. Yeah, he had nine interceptions in three years. Somebody will definitely sign up for that, plus he can contribute on special teams. So you definitely like the versatility. That is an appealing factor. He is Eric McKinney, Managing Editor at WeRSC.com. Eric, as always, greatly appreciate the time and the insight and very much look forward to talking down the road. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the time. Thank you. You got it. Our pleasure. So Eric McKinney with the latest in terms of the ins and outs of what's going on with respect to the USC prospects. And, you know, he brings up an interesting point, really, on both sides of the ball, Paul. When you evaluate any of these players, the defense was a mess for USC last season. So you got to take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. And then on offense, to his point, well, Caleb Williams didn't have the same security 
whether it be the offensive line, the time to survey the field, and you know some of the weaponry was a little bit inconsistent. And I think that's the biggest challenge for these NFL evaluators because, you know, Paul, I say this all the time, it's the environment that shapes the quarterback more so than the individual skill set. The translation from the college situation to the NFL is always the biggest question mark. Most scouts can figure out if the guy's got the tools. That's, that's probably the easiest thing to do. But then you got to figure out his football acumen. You got to figure out his leadership qualities. You got to figure out his heart and his drive and his his intensity. And you got to figure out uh, is is he of good character to fit in with the program? Is he a good teammate? These are all those intangibles that you can miss on. And and then of course, like you just said, there's the scheme fit. And look, bottom line is, the draft is still going to be a crapshoot, no matter how you slice it. And you just try to check as many boxes as you can when you pick a guy. Well, while USC has some appealing offensive weaponry, UCLA is going to produce guys to slow down the opposite side of the ball (laughs) as we now turn our attention to the Bruins class. And we are joined by a former UCLA quarterback. He now serves as the color analyst for the UCLA radio network, none other than Matt Stevens. Matt, you got Lance Meadow, Paul Dottino here on Big Blue Kickoff Live, Giants.com. Greatly appreciate the time. Hope all is well. How's everything on your end? It's going great here in San Diego. I actually just had a, uh, a meet and greet with Deshaun Foster, the new head coach of UCLA. Real promising young man. Well, that is very nice as you start to turn the page to the new regime on the collegiate level. We're trying to turn the page to the new group of prospects that will be wearing NFL uniforms. And as I mentioned, it's all about the defense, Matt, for UCLA. So let's start with, obviously, their star pass rusher, Layatu Latu. And I want to start with concerns and question marks because there's no doubt about it. The last two seasons have been impressive. But he did have a brief medical retirement where you hear the term neck injury and that's always concerning for anybody associated with the NFL. In your eyes, Matt, have you seen enough in the last two years? And he did play 25 games, so the volume is there, that any concern leading up to those two seasons has dissipated or do you feel as if he still needs to prove that he's over that hump? Uh, I hear by far over that hump. I mean, during that medical uh, year, he actually played rugby. You know, it wasn't like he was sitting around. <laughs> not doing anything. Sure. And, you know, in the two years he's played, I mean, there's been no sign of any kind of, you know, neck injury or anything. You would never even think that. You would think he has been playing his entire life. So I, I don't even think that could be a concern. Do you like his... I don't want to say motor because we could see by the way he plays, he plays hard. But did you ever get the sense at all that since he came back, there was any sense of fear or any sense of, uh, I don't even want to use the word timid because I don't like to use that with football players. But I think you know what I mean, apprehension that I don't know how much time that I'm going to have on the field because this thing could come back and hurt me. Uh, No signs whatsoever. I mean, this is a guy... First of all, he's six foot five, two hundred and sixty seven pounds. He's very thin. I think he's gonna play more towards two eighty five mm-hmm. once he gets in the NFL. I think he's gonna put on weight and be even bigger. The thing about him was he was a pass rusher. He's very quick. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people when they think about him, they're thinking, All right, this guy's really an edge guy at two forty. They don't realize he's two sixty seven. That's how quick he is. But what impressed me most about this season for him the second half of the season, he became a run stopper. I mean, he wasn't, he was a pass specialist. He was always, you know, everybody talked about sacks, but he really devoted himself to stopping the run and became a complete player this year. I mean, this guy, I, I, he's going to be one of the best in the NFL, I think, just because of his size and he, he's, he plays lean and he plays fast. Matt, you're going to like him more as a defensive end in a 4 3 then? He's definitely a defensive end in a 4-3. I don't see him at all playing a linebacker position. Uh, he's going to be in a stance. And you can also move him around uh, to the middle. I mean, what UCLA did with him on nickel defenses, they put him at defensive tackle, and he is so fast he can beat guards and centers. So uh, he's an interior defensive lineman uh, 100%. Matt, I want to piggyback off of your point about stopping the run because, I mean, you want to make sure that if you're going to draft somebody of his stature that 
you can keep him on the field for every single down. What jumps out to me is nearly half of his tackles were for loss. So that clearly shows the disruption. But if we could get you to peel back the layers a little bit more, how much did he penetrate and stop the run in the backfield versus being a guy that would just help clean things up after the runner maybe got to the half level or second level of the defense? There's no doubt about it. His first step off the snap is probably his biggest weapon. Um, but he was more disciplined in terms of not being one of those kind of guys that gets upfield with penetration so fast that you give the inside away. He's a guy that is disciplined. He'll come down the line. He'll squeeze. Uh, he has great hand placement where he can free himself up. Um, but he understands the game. I mean, he's not going to create a big gap in your defense because he's over anxious to get to the quarterback. I mean, he understands where he needs to be on run or pass. He doesn't come out of his lanes. Uh, I mean, he was very impressive. His, his football IQ is very high. All right, now a guy you have out there with the Bruins who's going to be the opposite, who'll be probably an edge guy in a 3-4 is Gabriel Murphy. And I think the thing that I liked about him, Matt, and please, again, correct me if I'm wrong, when I watched the tape on him, he's a guy who just gets the production done. He may not have all the perfect measurables that are going to wow scouts and open their eyes and drop their jaws, but the guy just makes it happen. He's got a motor, and he gets after it. And, and those intangibles can be hard to, hard to find sometimes. Yeah, he's an angry defensive end. I mean, he's <laughs> a guy that, it's, yeah, I mean, he, he's going to make plays, and he's going to get a little nasty. I mean, he doesn't have a problem with that. And, uh, you know, he's probably not as disciplined as Latu, um, but he's a guy that if he gets into a system, you know, and starts playing more under control, uh, he's a tremendous athlete. Uh, he, he's a great penetrator, too. And also – UCLA, once again, they put him at defensive tackle on nickel situations, and he can use his speed to get to the pass, uh, the passer. So, you know, he can play all around that defensive line, and I wouldn't be surprised if he stands up a little bit in the 4-3. Hmm. I think what's interesting, and this pertains to lot too as well, since he started his career in Washington, is Murphy was at North Texas, and we should also mention his twin brother, his identical twin yes. brother, is also on the team in Grayson. But how much did you see from an intellectual standpoint, Matt, him adjust from what they asked him to do at North Texas to what they asked him to do at UCLA? And the reason I ask that is he's going to come to the NFL – now he's going to have to start the process all over again. New scheme. Heck, they may put him somewhere where UCLA did not line him up. So from an X's and O's grasping standpoint, what jumped out to you about him? Well, Dan Lynn was the defensive coordinator for UCLA. He came from the Ravens, and they were running some pretty complicated stuff. And uh, they, you saw the Murphy Twins. They were on the field you know, pretty much 80%, 90% of the time because they're so versatile. And that's going to be what I think of Gabriel. He's versatile. He can do so many different things. Can he learn the NFL schemes? I don't think it's going to be a problem because of the scheme they ran at UCLA, and they used him in so many different positions. So um, the one thing about him, I mean, he's, like I said, he plays angry. He has to play under control. We called it the Murphy tax. Sometimes they would get a personal <laughs> foul a game, and uh, you've got to be careful with that. Uh, well, it was the mean green, by the way, that he came from. So yeah, I guess right? that's fitting that he played angry. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Darius Moisseau, and I think I got that pretty close, uh, undersized linebacker, uh, only ran 4 7 is the, uh, the time that I saw for him at the combine. So maybe in some uh, statistical categories, he might be a tad overmatched, but I think a guy on special teams, at the very least, should be able to carve out something of an NFL career, no? Yep, uh, Darius Buasau is how you pronounce okay. it, by the way. It's, that's all right. And he had a really productive career at Hawaii. Uh, and then he came to UCLA. And the first year at UCLA, he seemed a tad bit slow, to be honest with you. And then his senior year, he got faster. He got stronger. You really saw a lot of improvement. His instincts are off the charts. I mean, he can play really well in pass coverage. Uh, he knows how to time his blitzes, shoot gaps. He can make a, a, a tackle in the open field. Um, he's going to play on special teams, yes. I do think he's going to find a role uh, on defense, and then he's going to be a guy that all of a sudden, wow, he's in his eighth and ninth year as an NFL player. He's that smart of a guy. He mm -hmm. understands 
everything you need out of a middle linebacker, and he makes sure everybody's lined up in the right position. Matt, they have several other prospects, UCLA. A number of them are projected to be undrafted free agents. Anybody jump out to you that perhaps could sneak onto a roster or maybe is being overlooked with respect to this 2024 class? Well, Duke Clements, the center, uh, he was a he was a three-and-a-half-year starter for UCLA. Uh, he's one of those guys, kind of guys like Jake Brindle, who's now starting for the San Francisco 49ers, sure. doing a great job. He's really intelligent. You know, he's a 300-pounder. Uh, he's very versatile. Uh, he has great feet, great hand placement. You know, he's going to be a free agent. I think he's going to be one of those kind of guys that's going to stick with the program uh, or an NFL team for a long time. So that's sort of my sleeper as a free agent for UCLA. A final one from me, Matt, and it's a little bit unfair, but since you played quarterback and you're out there on that left coast, and I know you've seen Caleb Williams could you just give me a quick thumbnail sketch of what you might like about him or what you might still question? Obviously, you had a chance to see a lot of him. So before every game, I go down on the field, and I look at the opposing team, and I you know, try and get some things that I can use in my broadcast. And Caleb Williams, the ball comes out of his hand differently. I mean, there is some rotation on that football. He can throw any throw he needs to. He has excellent feet. Um, and, and he really does have a fastball. I mean, he can he can mm. really sling it. Uh, the other thing I noticed about him too, because I wanted to hate him because he's USC, <laughs> and he's so and UCLA, but his teammates love him. I mean, yeah. he is the guy that they gravitate towards, and they want to play for him. And he is a competitor. And Jim Harbaugh said it best: "What do you want out of your quarterback? For him to be a competitor." That guy wants to win more than anyone else on the field. And the Bears are going to draft him, and they're going to build a team around him, and hopefully they get some linemen to protect him. But he is Patrick Mahomes. I'm telling you, Patrick Mahomes, and I know what I'm saying. You know, I mean, everybody's like, oh, Patrick Mahomes. So, you know, how can he be that? (laughs) He's going to be that kind of guy. I mean, he really is. I mean, he's worth being the first guy picked. I've never been more impressed with a quarterback, and he's a once in a decade guy. Well, that's going to be music to Ryan Poles' ears because he was in Kansas City, Matt, when they drafted Patrick Mahomes, <laughs> and he couldn't bring him <laughs> along with him to Chicago. So if your prediction comes to fruition, Chicago is going to be all smiles, ear to ear, based on his projection. He is Matt Stevens, former Bruins quarterback, now serves as the color analyst for the UCLA Radio Network. Matt, always good going back and forth. Greatly appreciate the time of the inside and look forward to having you back on the program again. Thanks, Matt. Hey, thanks Thanks for having me on. You got it. Our pleasure. And that is a breakdown of the UCLA prospects. The emphasis, obviously, on the defensive side of the ball here, Mm. more so than the offensive side of the ball. But very complimentary of Caleb Williams in terms of what he saw up close and personal down on the field. Yeah, look, again, a lot of people, and rightfully so, uh, are enamored with his ability to make plays. And, yes, I saw his interaction with some of his SC teammates out at the Combine. And there's no doubt about that part of it. We could talk about all the other stuff another time, but I will say this. I love what he said about Latu because I think he is a 4-3 defensive end. I do think he is the best pass rusher in this draft, in my opinion. I know Turner from Alabama, the edge rusher uh, on some people's charts may be a little bit higher. I happen to think Latu is, but as you know, Lance, I put a lot of stock in that college injury report. Yeah. And that that really would give me pause for concern. Well, that's why I asked the question. To pick yeah. him in the top 10. You know, I, I asked people at the Combine, you know, how likely would he be up there, you know, for sure, if he didn't have the injury history. And that's kind of the impression that I got, is that the only reason that he wouldn't be, you know, somewhere in the bottom half of the top 10 is because of the uh, the neck problem. Well, and the reason why, to me, it's worthy of discussing is the fact that, as Matt pointed out, he expects him to put more weight on. He's too, at 280. Right? And he's How about that? 259 right now. At least he's listed. So. That, would, that one really caught my ear. No, 280. It, it did as well. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of poundage that you're putting on. But also, you think about the more you're carrying on your frame, the neck. I can't help but think about that. Yeah. So, you hear horror stories, players who didn't even have neck injury histories all of a sudden have problems in the NFL. I think you got to be careful and you got to be cautious. Do I feel good that he's gotten through two years with a clean bill of health? I mean, that makes you feel good. 
that's encouraging. But you know with injuries, sometimes guy has an injury, he goes two to three years, no issue, and then all of a sudden it rears its ugly head later on because you just never know. You get hit by the wrong angle, guy falls on you, hard to predict these things. Well, yeah. I mean, remember remember um, um, Jalen Phillips coming out of Miami? Yep. Had injury history, significant injury sure. history. And he just got hurt again this past season. But everybody thought coming out in terms of his pass rush ability, this guy should be one of the impact pass rushers of this draft. How far is he going to go? And and he certainly lost some draft points because of that that injury uh, a folder. It it just it's part of the deal. Um and yes, he did get hurt again this year. Yeah, it was a shame. I mean he popped his Achilles on a non contact move against the Jets here at MetLife Stadium. And obviously he's gonna be going through a, a very grueling off season process once again. But it's all part of that's it. a good example of and somebody it, it now was, it was a different injury than what he had dealt with I know. with respect to college, but you just wonder how much stress can a player take and on he, his body. And he looked like early in his career that he was going to be very productive. Yep. He, he he had put some good tape on the field with the Dolphins. Real quickly before we wrap up, because we didn't have an opportunity to maybe give our perspective of some of the USC prospects. We talked a lot about Caleb Williams. I mean, Brendan Rice, he looks the part. And I understand yeah. he's got the Jerry Rice connection, but what jumps out to me, Paul, is normally when you have a guy that's six two six three, you don't consider them speedsters. But he can get separation unlike anybody else. And that, to me, is extremely appealing. Because I think if you ask any coach, yes, you want to be able to win the 50-50 balls. You want to be able to win the battles with defensive backs, which is what we were talking about with Eric McKinney. But you cannot teach separation. That is number one. Can you find ways to get open? Brendan Rice can get open. So that, to me, is a great asset that I can coach him to improve in the other areas of maybe embracing the physicality and avoiding some of the dropsies here or there. You're not going to get other guys that are that solid in terms of creating separation. What did I write down about Brendan Rice from the Combine? Um, I thought this was very interesting. He actually said he'd be very excited to go to New York. Uh, he was asked about potentially coming to the Giants. Obviously, he'd be a later round pick. Yeah, he's not projected about the third round. Exactly. Being thrown out. Um Said his whole thing, he he believed that being part of his father's family was a blessing because the work ethic and the standard, as we all know, Jerry Rice was the ultimate prepared workaholic that the NFL has ever seen. And he said, that forced me to meet that challenge. So, you know, he doesn't shy away from that. He uses it as, as a badge of honor and as a motivator. Some guys... You know, when their dad played in the league, maybe they're a little intimidated by it. Maybe it's a little bit too hot of a spotlight. Not the case for Rice at all. Uh, he himself said, I will not be outworked, which is something that his dad said time and time and time again. Um, he said to him, he thought his most important uh, attribute that he was able to work on at USC was tape work. He said, I knew that tape work was critical for me to take the next step. So he has become not just an on-field workaholic, but also a tape study aholic. I think Rice is gonna is gonna be okay in this league. I don't know how high his ceiling will be, but I think he's gonna make it. He's gonna be around a while, and he's gonna do some good things in the NFL. Plus, he has special teams experience at Colorado no doubt. as no a doubt. kickoff and a punt returner. And something tells me Jerry sat down with him a few times and taught him a thing or two to pick up. When studying film as yeah, well. Yeah, and, and I don't think that was just verbal coaching. No, I, I think it's legit. No, I could see them having sessions at home where Without Jerry a doubt. even whips out his own film and says, hey, these were the things I did to get open and so forth. No, I'm completely with you. And, and that is something that I think is important to pick up because there are kids that are byproducts of great NFL players who sort of have that attitude I'm going to walk into the NFL. Everything's going to come my way. He doesn't give off that aura. No chip on his shoulder at all. Yeah. This is a kid who is very, very happy to earn everything that he gets. And I, I, I'm telling you right now, after meeting him, I'm going to root for him. Yeah. I, I really am. I don't care where he lands. 
I hope he has a good NFL career. It won't be it won't be his dad's, but that's okay because no one well, else has ever had that of career. Course, yes, I mean he's in a different stratosphere. <laughs> so listen, if he could carve out a lengthy NFL career, that would be a heck of an accomplishment. Be great. I mean, how many father son tandems do you see are able to duplicate that? So that would be something. That is going to wrap up Monday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live here on Giants.com. Today's episode is part of the Giants platforms everywhere and Giants.com slash podcast. We'll be up and running again on Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern. You got Alabama on the docket as we'll put the Crimson Tide under the microscope. For Paul Dottino, I'm Lance Meadow. Stay locked to Giants.com for all the latest, and we'll speak to you on Tuesday right here on BBKO. Have a good one. All-inclusive vacations make life easy with endless eats, bottomless drinks, and never-ending fun. So booking an all-inclusive vacation should be easy too, right? That's where Apple Vacations comes in. Book your all-inclusive getaway with Apple Vacations and receive exclusive perks at select resorts. You'll find the best deals to Hyatt, Zalara, Riviera Maya in Mexico and enjoy a selection of exclusive nonstop vacation flights. Turn on easy mode at applevacations.com or call your local travel advisor to get started. Visit applevacations.com or call your local travel advisor to get started. Hi, I'm Gabby Reese. Join me and my husband, big wave surfer Laird Hamilton, on our journey with Laird Superfood. From our kitchen to yours, we've crafted delicious plant-based creamers, coffee, greens, and so much more using high-quality functional ingredients. Visit LairdSuperfood.com and use the code GABBY2024 for 20% off your first order.